Take your Bibles, if you would, please, this morning and open them to the book of Luke. Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 23. As we look at today, Atonement Day. Atonement Day, the Day of Atonement. So we're going to be looking at that, talking about that, what that means, what it involved, what it implied as we take a look at the life of our Lord here. Beginning in verse number 32 of Luke chapter 23, the Bible says, And there were also two other male factors uh, led uh, him to be put to death. Uh, And when they were come to the place, keep that phrase in mind, to the place where, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, this is the first saying of seven sayings of the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be the Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over him in the letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, This is the king of the Jews. And one of the male factors of which were hanged railed on him, say, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Does not thou fear God, seeing that we are in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said uh, unto Jesus, Lord, remember me. When thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily, truly, I say unto thee, Today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. That's from 12 noon to 3 p.m. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst, or in the center of the middle. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. So when we think about uh, the death and burial, the resurrection of Jesus, we often think about what it means to us and what does it provide for us. I think the key word of, of the cross is atonement. And we're going to look at that this morning. Father, how we do thank you and we praise you for what we've seen and heard already this morning. Thank you for the blessings we've had in singing about the blood. Thank you for the composers that wrote those wonderful songs, all biblical and scriptural, about the blood of our Lord. Thank you for the song that Miss Carol sang for us that reminded us when you were on the cross, and yet at the same time we were on your mind as you looked down through time. And Father, we thank you and we praise you for that. We thank you we can now take a look into your word this morning. We ask that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and our guide. He would teach us all truth, guide us into all truth. We ask that he would give us illumination, understanding. He would bring to remembrance the things Jesus has said to us. Lord, and we ask that he would again be our director and divine teacher this morning. We ask for his anointing upon the word of God. And by all means, Lord, we ask for your anointing upon your servant. For, Father, we cannot stand in this place. Nor can we proclaim the truth of God's word apart from the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. So we thank you for it. We receive it by faith because we ask it in faith believing. And we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I way of introduction for a little while here. Atonement. The day Jesus went to the cross. Today is Palm Sunday, of course, and this would be the triumphal entry into Jesus as he came into Jerusalem that day. And 
The crowd would be throwing down their palm branches and celebrating, Hosanna, Hosanna. That means Jesus saves, salvation, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and having a great day of celebration. And while they were celebrating, no doubt why Jesus was riding on the lowly donkey there, he was thinking about these are the steps of the beginning of the cross. These were the steps that would begin to take the journey that would lead to the cross on Friday as we approached this week. So he knew that. The people were celebrating for a moment his arrival, and yet Jesus was also, I think, thinking that in their celebration that this was the journey to our redemption. As we take a look at that day. So what do we know about the word atonement? since that's what we're going to focus on today. If you have your Bibles, you can open to Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. I'm going to read it here in just a minute, but Romans chapter 5 and verse 11, that's just a few books further on, and we'll take a look and see what the Apostle Paul has to say about this and make a comment or two on it in the way of our introduction. Since we mentioned the word atonement, atonement day, what does that word mean? What does atonement involve? Paul writes in Romans chapter 5 and verse number 11, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it is. By whom we have now received the atonement. I want you to focus on that phrase for just a moment. By whom we have now received the atonement. I want you to notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say by what. Are you all getting this? It doesn't say by what we have received the atonement, but by whom. You see, we do not receive atonement through a church. We do not receive atonement through ourselves. Okay? We do not receive atonement from our good works. See, we just read who we received it from. Amen? It is by whom... And we have received atonement by, by, through, and from Jesus Christ. Atonement is not something but someone. And that someone, of course, is Jesus. Now the word, this is interesting, the word atonement means to make at one. To make at one. So what does it mean to make at one? Well, that implies a division. This is what that implies, you see, because man was separated from God, you see, from the sin of Adam, and we've all been separated since then. And so now, because of atonement, and those of us who have received that, we are now have been made one at God. And that's a good thing to be. It's a good thing to be one at God, all right? And so one with God, we need that because of Jesus. Another word we focus on sometimes that is synonymous with atonement is the word propitiation. It's found three times in the New Testament, of course. This means a covering. Some have referred to it as the substitutionary atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross for us. But the real word of it means a covering. That's why in 1 John 2, 2, the Bible says, And he, that is Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins. Now, for all that crowd out there that thinks it uh, was for the sins of a select group, a special group, selected only few, let's read what the Bible says. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. For whosoever will may come. For whosoever believes shall be saved. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. You see. Well, there's another word that's synonymous with propitiation and atonement, and that is reconciled. We find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. You see, through the atonement, because there was a division, we were separated from God. We had to be brought back into a relationship with God. And that was through the atoning death of Jesus Christ on the cross. And through that, God, we were reconciled back to God that once was broken we didn't have. 
and by the way, it doesn't stop there, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So guess what? You're all ministers of the gospel. You're all to be ministering the ministry of reconciliation. It's not just up to the preacher. It's not just up because I'm ordained. I'm sorry I don't have time to ordain all of you, but you don't need to be ordained to tell somebody about Jesus and how to get saved and be reconciled to God through the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not difficult. Verse 19 of 2 Corinthians 5. To wit that God was in Christ. What was he doing? Reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So the atonement involves being made at one with God. And that's through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The propitiation is the covering of that sin. And we'll get a little further into that a little bit later on. And then we've become reconciled to God, a relationship brought back into the relationship with God because of the atonement. So, folks, this is why Jesus came. He came to bring us back to God. So every step Jesus took on this earth was leading up to the day of atonement, which would be this Friday would start on Thursday night in the upper room with the Lord's Supper. So let's take a look now at some of those steps for a moment, starting in the upper room. All right? If you'll go with me. It's Thursday evening, and they've made preparation, and they've gone to the upper room now, he and his disciples, and they're getting ready to have the last supper. They're getting ready to have the last supper. Passover. Hello. Jesus, you see, is the final sacrifice. He was the final Passover. And now would introduce to us, you see, and inaugurate a new supper called the Lord's Supper, the New Testament in my blood. We no longer celebrate an animal being sacrificed for our sins. We now celebrate Jesus, the final Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. So they're going there, and Jesus is sharing with them. And, you know, in part of that, he says, let not your hearts be troubled. All you believe in God, fellows, believe also in me. Why is that so? Because in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also, and the way you know and the how. And Thomas says in verse 6, in 5, Lord, we don't know the way and know how, where you're going. And Jesus said in verse 6, I am the definite article of thee. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Thomas. No man comes unto the Father except by me. And he says, one of you here tonight shall betray me. They all begin to ask, is it I, is it I? And Jesus said, certainly, Master, is it I? Jesus said, it is you, Judas, the one who dips in the cup with me. Go and do what you have to do. Do it quickly. They went on and had the supper and fellowship. It's about 9 p.m. now. They make their way out of the upper room and across to go through the eastern gate, across into the Kedron Valley, which is a very small valley. It's not big and large, into the Garden of Gethsemane, which you can see the eastern wall of Jerusalem from the Garden of Gethsemane. And he goes there to pray. And he says, watch and pray, you guys. I'm going to go in a little further and pray. And you know, that's what he does. He comes back. He finds them sleeping. Could you not watch with me one hour? Pray. I'm going to go back. He goes back a second time. He comes back, finds them sleeping again, and tells them, go on, sleep. Goes in for a third time. And, of course, he's praying for the cup to be passed from him. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. He comes back, and he says, fellows, it's time. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be betrayed into the hands of those that are going to take his life. Here comes the soldiers, the temple guards, the high priest, Marcus, and good old Judas. Going to betray our Lord with a kiss on his cheek and betrays him. Well, immediately 
Peter pours out his sword. He's ready to go fight. He's slashing and slinging and everything and cuts off Marcus's ear. Now, you know he wasn't aiming for his ear. I guarantee you. Jesus gently, compassionately reached down, picked up Marcus's ear and put it back and healed him. Peter, put your sword up. It's not time. And off he goes, and from there he's taken, this is about midnight now, and he's taken to Caiaphas, the high priest. And there he's accused of blasphemy and accused of being the son of God and claiming to be this. Then from there they take him over to, to Pilate's hall there, to Praetorium, and gets with Pilate. Pilate says, now nah, go, and they take him back and take him to Herod. And then he goes back to them, a Pilate again, and back to Herod and them, and back to Pilate. And then we have six phony, mocked-up trials, illegal completely, that went on between midnight and 6 a.m. in the morning. Three Roman, three Jewish trials. He's beat, he's tired, he's wore out. He's weary, he's vulnerable, he's stressed. Mostly everything. And Pilate finally says, crucify him. But before he did, he took him and Let's get him flogged, whipped. He's taken to the Praetorian, and there the guards would take with a cat of nine tails. And two professional solicitors would begin to make the back of our Lord from his shoulders down to his feet, the backside, out of hamburger meat. There they would plant a crown of thorns, two and a half to three and a half inches in length on his head. They would take a reed and beat him in the head. Then they would begin to pluck his beard out of his face. Then they would punch him in the face. Then they would spit on him. And really, like they were really enjoying this. Total brutality and torture. Most average men would die from that. And then he would be led to walk the Via Della Rosa up to Calvary, carrying his cross. He could only go for so far and then collapsed. And they had to get Cyrene into finished carrying it for him and to help him. He would arrive there at the place of the skull called Calvary, which is where we get our word cranium, okay, the place of the skull, a place of pain, a place of suffering. Take his robe off of him. You can imagine how that felt. Throw him down on the ground, throw him on a cross, an old rugged cross that he made. And there they would take six-inch spikes that you see one up here, nailed in our cross. They would drive that through the meteor wrist, both sides and his feet, and go forth from there. And so we find ourselves at the place of atonement in our story tonight, this morning. I want you to look at it with me. Number one, the place of atonement, found in verses 33 through 38. Calvary is the place, it said. Look with me there in verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary. Calvary is the place of atonement. It was the place of suffering. The scripture says, and they crucified him there on the place of the skull. It was a horrible death, a horrible crucifixion. It's what they would do to him now that they're on that place this place of atonement called Calvary. When you sing the songs about Calvary, think of it as a place of suffering, as a place of pain. It was the place of atonement. You see. What do we know about this place of suffering? Well, first of all, we know his body was broken. I'm talking about the bones in his body. They crucified him. And we talked a little about whether they would take the nails of spikes and drive them here through the wrist right here. The wrist is always considered a part of the hand. If they'd have drove it in the palm of the hand, it would have pulled right out. The weight of the body would have just pulled them right out. So they put it into the wrist here, that which would support the weight in the feet. That was just the start of it. They would take Zen and they would lower him, raise him on a cross and boom, drop it in the ground and All the pain in all the world would shoot through his body and his legs. All the muscles and tendons and ligaments would probably tear and be torn through the weight of that. 
and all that going on and what they'd done to him and carrying a cross that weighed 75 to 125 pounds strapped to him on top of that just getting there. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, we took our sins and drove them like nails through his hands and feet. We lifted up high on the cross our transgressions and then we pierced his heart through with the spear of our unbelief. And the whole time Jesus was doing all of this for you and I, ladies and gentlemen. It was all for us. Hebrews 10, the writer says in Hebrews 10, 12, 10 through 12, by the which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. I like the next one. I hope you're following along in your notes. I might stop and ask you, how long? Once for all. How long was he sacrificed? Once for all. And every priest that standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices. Now that's what the priest did in Jesus' time. But we have priests today in every denomination and faith you can imagine that are daily offering sacrifices all the time of all kinds of sacrifices. That still goes on to this very day. But may I remind you what the scripture says, which can never take away sins. There's no sacrifice that any man, church, religion, denomination, I don't care if he's a priest, Buddhist, cardinal, pope, preacher, Baptist, independent, missionary, evangelist, whatever denomination or faith there is, none of us can ever offer a sacrifice that would take away our sins. It took the blood of Jesus Christ and Him only. Why do I know that? Because the Bible says so. Oh, you're just so dogmatic and narrow-minded. That's because this book is dogmatic and narrow-minded. May I remind you that broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there travel it, but road, the narrow and straight is the road that leads to life everlasting, and few that find it. You don't get any more narrower than that. But this man, speaking of Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, for how long, church? forever set down on the right hand of God. You see why? Because his work was finished. Their work and all that they were doing was never finished. That's why they keep doing it today. But Jesus, our high priest, the work was finished. You see, when he died and gave up the ghost, he said, to tell us die. It is finished, paid in full. So we see his broken body is the place of suffering. It was a place of of suffering because he shed his blood. Look at verse 34 with me. Verse 34 in our text. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them. May I remind you, the only person that can forgive you is God. Hello. I can't forgive you. Missionaries, preachers, Baptists, Pope, I don't care who you are, cannot forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus said, forgive them. Ooh, how about that? Isn't that fantastic? For they know not what they do. Said the same for us. Matthew put it this way, Matthew 5, 44. This is why when we understand, I believe, the cross of Christ and the day of atonement and his shed blood for our sins, when we understand it, I believe Jesus had this very thing, this thought in mind when he preached his sermon on Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 5, he was already considering looking at the cross and all that would take place. Look what he says in Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. I believe he had the cross in mind when he was teaching that. And we can understand that more today. You see, and by the way, forgiveness is only possible through Christ. And Christ only. It's only, the only forgiveness is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we see his broken body, we see his shed blood. That's why 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, follow along with me. For as much as you know, say I know, what do you know? That we were not, what, redeemed, purchased, bought 
with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by the tradition, that vain conversation means your lifestyle, your manner of living, received by the tradition of your fathers. Here's the conjunction and the contrast. But, so how are we redeemed? We were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Did you know, CJ, it took more to redeem us than it did to create us? To create us, it was the spoken word, but to redeem us was the blood of Christ. And not only was it a place of shame and suffering of his broken body and of his blood, but I want you to know also it was a place of shame. Look at verse 34, 35, and 36 with me. And we see this place of shame beginning in verse number 34. Then Jesus said, forgive them for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Here was the Son of God dying on the cross for those very soldiers that were gambling for his coat. Shooting the dice. Some of you for today's language, shoot the craps. That might help you out a little bit. I grew up in the construction area, and that went on the construction site all the time. I saw men lose their money, their paychecks, everything, shooting craps. Oh, come on, baby, come on, baby, give me a seven. And all, oh, man, snake eyes. Oh, and on and on and on. I said, my goodness, you don't have to be rich to have your money soon parted, do you? The fool and his money is soon parted, the Scripture says. But here the precious Son of God was shedding His blood, possibly even and that coat they were on was already bloodied up from being on His back, and here they were casting lots. What shame and reproach to the Son of God. Notice who else was involved in it. And the people stood beholding. Well, that's interesting. Anybody know what that is? That means they were staring. Are you with me? Hello. They were staring, they were gazing and staring at him, beholding. And then the next group, and the rulers, these are the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Sanhedrin that makes the rules. All of them were derided him, saying, he saved others, let him save himself. They were deriding him. I mean, you know, I mean, that mean, that mean, you know what that means? That means deriding means to, to laugh at scornful. It means to make fun of. It means to ridicule. So this was by the religious leaders. This is by the ones that put him on the cross. What shame was being brought to him. Then in verse 36, it doesn't stop. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. You see, so we see the soldiers mocking him. We see the religious rulers and the religious people mocking him and ridiculing him and laughing at him. We see the other soldiers gambling for his lots. And then we see the people. These are the very same people, church, that on on Sunday today, they were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus saved salvation. And now they're saying, crucify him, crucify him, and staring at him. You ever had people stare at you? You know how you feel? You think, man, it's, uh, that people are staring at me. Boy, they look like they're just gazing through you with eyes of steel. So you see this whole crowd of the shame and reproach that was being brought to our Lord. That's why it's called the place of atonement. And the place is Calvary, which is the place of the skull. It was a place of suffering of his broken body. It was a place of suffering for his shed blood. It was a place of shame. Listen to what Isaiah says, Isaiah 53, 3 through 7. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as if our were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. And this is all talking about the cross, by the way, Isaiah's writing about. And afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. This was all the beating and the cross, everything that's going on. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Not talking about physical healing, folks. He's talking about spiritual healing. You can get healed physically all you want to and still die lost and go to a devil's hell without Christ. This man was going through what he was going through for the redemption of your soul, not the healing of your body. But those want to take that out of content and context. 
All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Oh, it was a total place of shame. So we see the place of atonement. There was an inscription that we read earlier, remember, over the, and you've probably all wondered what that meant. It was written in Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. But this is the king of the Jews. Again, this is, was mockery. This wasn't giving him a praise and, and honor and glory. It was total mock. The cross, folks, was nothing about praise and glory and honor. It was about mockery. It was about shame and pain and suffering and degrading. Butchered him, tortured him. The inscription was written in Greek on the account of the Hellenistic Jews who were there at Jerusalem because of the Passover. It was written in Latin, that, be, that being the language of the government under which he was crucified. And it was written in Hebrew, that being the language of the place in which this deed of darkness was committed. So shame him. He was, shame was brought to him for, literally from this, from every corner of the earth. So there was the shame. There was the place of atonement, a place of suffering. Now let's look at the provision of atonement. The provision of atonement, verses 39 through 43. Everybody with me in 39 through 43. One of the malefactors which were hanged rail on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Does that not fear God? Did you notice something right there? Did anybody catch anything there what the other thief caught? One thief was railing on him, and the other thief rebuked him and said, Don't you fear God? Isn't that interesting? That even the other malefactor, the thief, the criminal that was dying, recognized that Jesus was God? Isn't that a shame that a man dying on a cross, his last breath, recognizes that this is God, yet the world today cannot recognize that. The world today will fight and argue with you, and there are denominations all over the country and in the, in the world preaching and teaching that Jesus Christ is not God incarnate in the flesh. And might I say that He is? He absolutely is God in the flesh. So we see there... But the other answer rebuke, does that not fear God, seeing that we are in the same condemnation? Okay, and we justly deserve what we get, and we receive our due reward, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Whoa, now he calls him Lord. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. Listen what the other thief says. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Well, he had to know there was life after death, didn't he? He had to know that Jesus was going to be resurrected from the dead. Oh, this is, this is fantastic. So what do we see in this provision of atonement? What does, prov the prov what does the cross provide for us? Number one, it provides forgiveness for the repented heart. It provides forgiveness for the repented heart. Those whose hearts are willing to repent of their sin and come to Christ will have total forgiveness and pardon. That's what we saw right here. What did we see? We said one man rejects forgiveness. That was the malefactor. He was the one who had committed a crime. He was guilty of his crime and punishment, yet he absolutely, totally rejected forgiveness. Just like the world today. Most of the world today rejects God's forgiveness. They don't want it. They think they can get it anywhere else or from anybody else or anything else. Friend, the only way you're going to get forgiveness and the only place you're going to get it from and the only person you're going to get it from is the Lord Jesus Christ. Period. One man rejects it. The world rejects it today. One man receives forgiveness. I want you to notice in verse 43 there, and he was talking. 
in verse 42, and, and he, when he said that, he says, we indeed dress with him. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest in to thy kingdom. And notice what Jesus said. And Jesus said unto him in verse 43, verily or truly I say unto thee, today, present tense, right now, thou shalt be with me in paradise. See, one man rejected Christ, the other man received Christ. Both men in the same condition, both men guilty, both men dying. And yet one has enough sense in his heart and his mind. And I want three things he did. First of all, he realized he was a sinner. See, in order to get saved, folks, you've got to realize you're lost and you've sinned against God. So you've got to realize that you're a sinner and you can't save yourself and you need a Savior. And Jesus is the Savior. And this man on the cross recognized that he was guilty of his crime. He was a sinner and he asked God to forgive him. Because that's what it means when it means remember. The word means a remembrance of faith. Oh, this is, this is good. The he, 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 second thing he did, that Jesus was the Son of God when he called him Lord. And he asked in simple faith when he said, remember me. That's an ask of faith. God, I'm a sinner. I deserve this punishment. But by faith I recognize that you are the Son of God. John says that in 1 John. If you confess that He is the Son of God, you go read it later. Amen. He confessed that Jesus was the Lord. He was the Son of God. And He said in faith, remember me. That's why Colossians 2 9 says, For in Him, that is in Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily God in the flesh 2 Corinthians 5 19 to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation here's what's amazing about these two guys some saw Jesus raised to dead and did not believe huh the robber sees him being put to death and he believes that's fantastic that's awesome Romans 3, 24, 26, don't miss this. Being justified, being what? Being saved freely. How? By His grace. How? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a covering through the faith in His blood. To declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. When Jesus as holy God, his wrath was toward us. He died for our sin. God now is just now in letting us off because of what Jesus did. Because God's wrath is against sin. He's just in that. And so therefore the justifier has made us just because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Even what we deserve. I mean, it's just fantastic. God, and by the way, let me tell you something, church. God is not pleased with sin. God is never pleased with sin. But we got a world today that says, oh, tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. Everything's okay. God doesn't care. God doesn't mind. We can go live the way we want to. We can act the way we want to. We can get involved in every kind of sin, every kind of immorality, as Romans chapter 1, and it doesn't make any difference. Let me tell you something. God is not pleased with sin. Never. But he is pleased at his son's blood. Hello. And when you and I come to Jesus and accept the atonement of his blood for our sins, we have now been justified, made righteous before God because of the blood atonement of Christ. God then is now pleased with you and me. Hallelujah. God is never pleased with sin. You got to get that straight. You keep going the way you're going, die lost in your sins. You'll spend an eternity in hell without God. How sad, how sad. The provision of atonement provides me, first of all, forgiveness. Secondly, the provision of atonement provides me an eternity with Christ. 
in eternity with Christ. Look at verse 43 again. Jesus said, Jesus said what? And, he, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. All right? What's the Bible tell me? To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That man was about to die, and the next thing, he was going to be present with the Lord in paradise. Amen. Woo! Hallelujah. Somebody's always asking, where's paradise? Wherever Jesus is, is paradise. But I'll tell you in the Bible where it's at. Amen. All right. Here we go. Eternity. Now, the word paradise is an interesting word. It means the soul's destination immediately after death. This is what the word paradise means. It means the soul's destination immediately after death after death. That's why when we know Jesus, to be absent from this body is to be immediately in the presence of the Lord. Amen. That's where the thief was going. Oh, hallelujah. It also means, paradise also means the eternal abode with God. The eternal abode with God. So somebody says, okay, where's paradise? Well, let's read it. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. He that hath an ear. How many of you got an ear this morning? Amen. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Hello. Where's God? In heaven. Where's the tree of life? In heaven. Where's paradise? Heaven. I thought you'd like that little lesson this morning. If you don't get anything else, you'll get that. 1 John 5, 20, and we know, say we know. we know. What do we know? That the Son of God has come. How many of you know that? And have given us an understanding that what? That we may know. What are we to know? Him, that we may know Him that is true. And that we are in Him that is true. Even His Son, Jesus Christ. Oh, wait a minute. Look at the next phrase. This is the true God. Amen. Who is Jesus Christ. And with him comes eternal life. So what has atonement done? First of all, we see the place of atonement. It's a place of suffering. His body, his blood, a shame. Then we see, secondly, we saw the provision of atonement. It provides forgiveness to any and to all who are willing to come to Christ. No one has to be left out. That thief on the cross had just as much opportunity as the other one, but he rejected it. And you have just as much opportunity today to accept Christ and come to Christ. Quit rejecting Him. Amen. Amen. Lastly, if we wrap it up, as so we look at the last verses here, 44 through 46. The payment of atonement. It was a lonely death, a death of separation, but what did the payment of atonement do for us? Well, let's take and read it here. Verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, that is, 12 noon. And there was darkness over the earth until ninth hour, 3 p.m. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the mist. That's in the center, the middle. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit to telestai. And having thus said, he gave up the ghost. What did the payment of atonement provide for us when Jesus gave up the ghost. Remember what it said? The veil in the temple was rent. Are you with me? What that did now was gave you and I and everybody else access to God. Amen. We no longer had to go through a priest, a rabbi, a preacher, a Baptist Methodian, a Catholic. No, we no longer had to go through the church, a denomination, a religion, or anything else. We could go direct access to God. Because you remember, the only person who could go in there was the high priest into the Holy of Holies. There was the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's bud, and all of that stuff. There was the mercy seat, and the priest would take the shed blood of a lamb, an innocent lamb, and he would go in, and he would place that blood on the mercy seat for the atonement of the people of Israel for their sins for a year. Are you with me? Amen. All right, hang in here. Hebrews 9, 24. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, 
which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. He is our mediator between God and man. He is our advocate, our intense lawyer. He is our intercessor in prayer. That's what he's doing for us. But oh, don't, don't miss this now. Hang in here. Hebrews 10, 19, and 20. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. How do we do that? We, brethren, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. That's the Lord's Supper, the new and living way. Which he hath consecrated for us, watch this now, through the veil that is to say his flesh. Are you with me? In other words, when Jesus bowed his head and gave up the ghost, immediately as the priest was sacrificing the lamb and placing his blood on the mercy seat, God rent the veil because the flesh, the flesh of Jesus now was torn and rent his flesh. At the same time, the veil was rent in the temple. And God said, because of what my son Jesus did on the cross, I've opened up the access to everyone because his flesh was torn and ripped and so forth. And God took it from the top and broke it down down and ripped it at the same exact time I would have liked to have been there to see that priest oh my goodness oh the veil of his flesh was torn for you and I and so God took now because Jesus is now our mercy seat and the blood of Christ is applied to us hallelujah The payment for atonement was access to God, and it was also given freely by Christ. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Do you know what he was quoting there? Psalms 31.5, by the way. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. John 10, 17 and 18 says this, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. Isn't it interesting? No one could predict that except God himself. Jesus predicted and prophesied his own death when and how. Nobody does that but God. In conclusion, atonement. Simply put, Jesus gave his all for you in order that you and I might have forgiveness, a home in heaven. But you must believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for you and for your sin. And then you receive that atonement for that sin by faith in Christ. Jesus said in John 13, 15, 13, there is no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for a friend. In the next verse he says, and ye are my friends. Aren't you glad you're the friend of Jesus? Aren't you glad Jesus laid down his life for you? Friend, there's a picture of atonement. It all started with Palm Sunday leading up to Thursday and Friday and through Sunday of the resurrection. But it was the, the atonement of the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses all sin. And without the shedding of that blood, there is no remission, there's no forgiveness of sin. Today, if you're here and you've never trusted Christ, You've never received the, the atonement payment for your sin by faith and trust in Christ. We're going to ask you to do that in just a moment. I think you've had a clear understanding, I trust, I hope. I begged and plead with God to help me with this. Make it understanding so everyone could understand it from a child up. And those that are watching by Rumble, God bless you. If you're here with us and you're still watching, don't leave. Stay right there. Don't turn it off, please. 
If you're watching later this week on Rumble and YouTube and our Facebook and uh, our, our internet service and television next week on television, it'll be on and the radio and all of that. Listen to me. Don't, don't, don't reject Christ today. There's no better time than to do it on the Day of Atonement. What better time could you have than want to come to Christ and to receive Him as your Lord and Savior? Hey, listen to me. If Jesus can forgive and save a criminal that's dying next to Him on a cross, He can save you. And you're saying, well, preacher, you don't know what I've done, where I've been, what I've said, how I've lived. No, but I know that thief wasn't any good either. He was a criminal, thief, murderer, you name it. He had to do some pretty bad things to be sentenced to crucifixion. And yet, Jesus didn't argue with him. He didn't debate with him. He answered him immediately, CJ. And by the way, I don't know how all this happened, but when you read Isaiah, it says that his visage was so marred that he could not be recognized as a man. That's how bad they beat him up. If you go to Mayo Clinic and do the research on the resurrection of Christ, and all they go through all the things he went through by the scripture. And all what they did just to his face and head would cause the human skull to swell two to three times larger than it was. Using a term, uh, disrespectful, looked like some kind of cyclops. You could not even recognize him. But yet through all of that, this man said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And I'm sure he was wondering for a moment and paused and thought, I wonder if he's going to answer me. I wonder what he will say. If he does, and Jesus, no doubt, if he could even turn his head, looked at him and said, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Friend, you have that same opportunity today. If you're willing to come to Christ, Recognize and realize you're a sinner, first and foremost. You can't save yourself. Only God can forgive you and save you. And let Jesus do that through his blood atonement and by faith. And it's interesting. I know we have all the tracks. We have all the methods. We have all the Roman roads and the John road and the Revelation road, the Ephesian road. Oh, man, we got them all. And all that man said was, Lord, he confessed with his mouth, remember me when thou comest into your kingdom. So he knew there was a resurrection. He knew he was going to be raised from the dead. That thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Amen. And that man got gloriously saved. You'll meet him one day if you know Jesus. I know another man. So I say he didn't have all the Roman roads and all the theology and all of that. He just had some good old common sense to realize something wrong with this picture. I deserve what I'm getting, but this man doesn't. There's something different and unique about this man. He's got to be who he said he was and who he is. I know another man that got saved a really unique way. He didn't know the Romans road or any other road. Didn't even know the Bible. But there was another man down here praying. I thank thee, God. I'm not like this man. This heathen, this, rep this publican over here. I tried, I, he went on and on. I, 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 I. Then this man over here that he despised and wasn't like. The Bible said he wouldn't even lift his head up towards heaven. But he beat on his chest, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, that man went home justified. That man went home saved. You see, God knows the heart, and God sees your heart today. 
I don't know what all the words that you've got, what you say, but if you just simply would be willing to admit that you're a sinner, you can't save yourself, you need a Savior. Christ is a Savior. He wants to save you. He wants to forgive you. However you want to put it, folks, there's no special thing. God knows your heart and ask Christ to save you today. And then when the time comes today, you will be with Him in paradise because the moment you close your eyes in death, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank God for the atonement, the day of atonement. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Those who are watching with us right now, Cindy, go ahead and play. Friend, if you've never trusted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we encourage you today to come to Christ. You've heard the message. You've heard the plea. You heard how a thief, a criminal, a thug, a murderer got saved. You heard how a, a, a man got saved. That just be merciful to me, God, a sinner. Oh, my friend, you need to come to Christ today. Jesus wants to save you. He loves you. He died for you. Shed his blood for you. You're willing to do that today and come however you want to. Well, I'm going to help you a little bit, if you'll allow me to. We're going to pray, and that's communicating with God. We're going to ask the Lord to forgive us and save us. And we're going to do that right now. I want you to pray with me. Dear God, that's right. Go ahead. I confess with my mouth, you are the Lord just like the thief did. I confess that I'm a sinner, just like the thief did. And I ask you to forgive me and to cleanse me, just like the thief did, my friend. I do believe now from what I've just heard, Jesus died on the cross for my sin. He paid my sin debt just for me. I do now call upon him. I believe he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And so right now, by faith, I do call upon you, Lord Jesus, and invite you and receive you into my life and my heart to be my Lord and my Savior. Take me to heaven someday when I die. And I pray this simple little prayer in faith believing in Jesus' name. Amen.